Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm doing a new movie review this week. It's called The Visit. It's another found footage horror story from the same producers of Paranormal Activity and Insidious. Not only that, but it's written and directed by, out of all people, M. Night Shyamalan. Yep, because I know a lot of people are familiar with this guy. Because he's responsible for bringing us all of his brilliant masterpieces, such as The Sixth Sense, which I love, by the way. It's my favorite of them all. Along with Unbreakable, a very underrated film, which I also love, too. Yeah, both stars, you know, Bruce Willis. Yeah. Yeah, Signs with Mel Gibson. Another one I love, too. Not as good as... Um, the Sixth Sense and Unbreakable, but still, you know, I mean, it had its flaws, but it was okay. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And of course, the, the very underrated film that sadly not many people talk about, and I wish they did, called Wide Awake, which was a family comedy that stars Rosie O'Donnell and Joseph Cross. Yeah, and I wish that film had more recognition today, because... It's hard to believe that he actually did do this movie. But then, he started his downfall with movies like The Village, which had Ron Howard's daughter in it, um, which I like, by the way, the actress. But, yeah, and, and I know Joaquin Phoenix uh, was in the film, who was also in the film Signs. And... It was not, despite of its good cinematography by Roger A. Deakins, who did uh, Fargo, and a wonderful score by James Newton Howard, the writing was really bad. I mean, yes, there were plenty of rewrites. You know, there was a story behind all of this, some controversy, and that's when the movie became, as we speak, uh, one of his worst films ever. And that's where it started his downfall. Yeah, and when he did movies like Lady in the Water, also starring Ron Howard's daughter, yeah, it was just a boring film, nothing interesting whatsoever, and that was the one with Paul Giamatti. And then, of course, we got The Happening, which was his first R-rated horror film that seems more like he was trying to throw in the tradition of Stephen King, that well, that's almost pretty much like the film... Tommy Knockers. I mean, I know there's a difference, but between those two films, this one seems more as laughable as it can get. Like, you can pretty much laugh at everything what's wrong with this fucking movie. And yeah, the happening was just fucking horrible at the same time. But then he went on to ruin one of the most popular shows on Nickelodeon called The Last Airbender, which I know it's Avatar The Last Airbender. But they didn't use the name Avatar because they didn't want to get confused with James Cameron's film, of course. And, yep, he pretty much ruined the whole thing by, by getting their characters' names pronounced wrong. Everything that went into it that, that tries to be exactly like how the show was was all ruined completely. Um, it was a complete punch to the face to all their fans. And you know what? I feel sorry for them. I mean, for those who are big fans of that series. And the worst part about this is that Shyamalan actually defended this. This fucking mess. And I even read an article that he might make a sequel to this. And I'm like, oh, for the love of God, no. That's why I wrote on the Facebook when I said Shyamalan needs to be stopped. And you know what? He does. Because I can't believe... Out of all people, since he loves the show, of course, because he has kids. You know, he, he, I mean, he loves the show so much that he just want to go around ruining it for everybody. I mean, fuck this, man. Then, of course, he wrote the screenplay for Devil, which is a horror movie about people getting stuck in the elevator, wanting to find out who the killer is. Big deal. And then, of course, the Will Smith film... After Earth, yeah, with his son Jaden. Just a sci-fi film that just didn't work. 
Not at all. And it was so bad that even Will Smith himself hated it. And yeah, he, and he felt bad about it since he's the one that uh, offered to do this mess. And he was the one who produced it too. Well, well now comes the visit. Only this time he's doing a found footage movie. And I don't know. This is why I'm not a big fan of found footage movies these days. I've been saying this many times already. And boy, this, this just seems to go on and on and on. But don't get me wrong though. There are some found footage movies I can deal with that's actually well made. Or there are some that actually could be worth watching even if it isn't, you know, the greatest movie ever made. Even if it isn't a complete masterpiece or any kind. I mean, yeah, I love Cloverfield, don't get me wrong, but I still wish they would stop using shaky cams. I mean, Chronicle is okay. I mean, I'm not a big fan of that film, but it does, but that doesn't mean that I hated it. I mean, at least it's a decent, uh, you know, action movie that could be worth watching, but I don't think it deserves to be, you know, this high on, as, you know, one of the greatest movies ever made. And of course, the Blair Witch Project. Once again, not a big fan, but still, I can appreciate the idea of of actually filming a movie that's set in the woods when you know something bad's about to happen. And yeah, maybe there are some films that I can deal with. I mean, yes, maybe when they're well made, it has a point. And not trying to become more like, oh, let's just you know bring some today's technology. Let's just bring in a laptop. Let's just bring in tons of cameras and and have kids or anybody else do the same thing just talk about you know random jokes and all this other stupid shit but once again i mean found footage movies just keeps getting worse and worse i think it's a tired formula and everybody's getting really sick of it i mean it's just the same thing you know because the last couple found footage i've been seeing including that terrible unfriended the, the Devil Inside, uh, even that that forgettable uh, Earth to Echo movie, I don't know. It's just, to, to me, I think found footage movies is just what it is, reality TV, but only you see it in the movie theater. Sometimes you can even see it um, simply direct to DVD or so. And it's still the same fucking bullshit, you know, people just... Bring their cameras just to film something that they're about to either do a documentary or or mockumentary or whatever the kind they do. And they, they just do the same fucking thing. They just shake, shake, shake until until you get sick. Yeah, motion sickness, nausea, vertigo, whatever. It's just, come on, man. I'm tired of that. But now we're getting to the other subject here, because since M. Light Shyamalan just wrote and directed this movie, a lot of people are asking, is he finally going back to his old roots when he finally, when he first did The Sixth Sense? You know, the movie where, you know, you take an actual premise of, of a scary movie, but you actually throw in the twist at the end, just to keep the, the story going. Well, all I had to say is, almost, because the movie does have a great premise. I mean, this is a movie about, you know, two kids actually visiting their grandparents, and they're just staying there for only one week, only to find out what's really going on with them. Yeah, even though they are old, and that's why we're going to review this movie today. Because the movie stars Olivia Dijon... Ed Oxenbrough, Catherine Hahn, Deanna Dunagan, Peter McRobbie, Benjamin Keynes, Celia Keenan Borger. Once again, written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan. The movie begins when a mother named Paula, who's played by Catherine Hahn, decided to go on a cruise with her new boyfriend during the week while her two kids. Rebecca and Tyler, who both played by Libby Dijon and Ed Oxenbowl, are preparing for a week-long stay with their grandparents, John and Doris, 
both played by Peter McRobbie and Deanna Dunican. And while the two kids had never met their grandparents before, they attended to film a documentary about their visit. Meanwhile, Paula, who has not seen her parents for 15 years after she fell in love with her high school teacher, Robert, who has since left her, told Rebecca a little about their disagreement she had with her parents, suggesting that she would need to ask for them for more details. So, once they were on the train, Rebecca and Tyler are just basically filming their documentary, you know, while Tyler is just name dropping, using celebrity names. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. And also uh, offered the train conductor to uh, join in their video, saying that I always wanted to be an actor. <laughs> yeah. And they just go around, you know, wrapping their video and all that. So on and so forth. Yeah, go further. Anyway, once they finally arrive at the train station, John and Doris had greeted them and went straight into the isolated farmhouse where Rebecca and Tyler are instructed never to go near the basement because it contains toxic mold, yeah, so they don't get sick. But that particular night, John tells Rebecca and Tyler that he and Doris are elderly, yes, old people. So that pretty much will bring in their dark secrets to each other. That during their bedtime at 9.30 p.m., an hour past her curfew, Rebecca wants up going downstairs for something to eat, only to discover that Doris was actually vomiting. Later on during the day, Rebecca mentions it to John, who dismiss it as, as begin to find out that Doris might be having a stomach flu. But John then says to her and Tyler that they must not leave the bedroom after 9.30 p.m. Because they knew exactly what was going to happen next. So over the next few days, Rebecca and Tyler had begun to notice their grandparents' strange behavior. And when Rebecca tries to ask Doris about what happened the day that Paula left home you know, during their interview, Doris begins to shake off her head completely until she calms her down. John and Doris are later confronted by a woman who was helped by them in counseling and who then goes into the house with them but we never had saw her left. Even worse, John wants up going with, um, with Rebecca and Tyler out and then we then found out that that he might have schizophrenia or something. Yeah, which, which he goes around, you know, afraid, you know, he's He's already, you know, spotting some person actually staring at him. And he went over to that guy and attacked him. And you know, Rebecca tries to stop him after that. You know, during the day with Rebecca and Tyler just, you know, talking to their mom on Skype, you know, with their laptops. And then they just go around, you know, playing around, you know, fooling around with each other. Scaring them half to death until, you know, Doris decided to join in to scare them with them. So during... The next couple nights, you know, after that, we begin to find out what Doris has been doing at night. You know, she's actually, you know, running around, you know, naked. She's even, you know, scratching the walls with her fingers. So they decided that during that one particular night, Todd was suggested that they should actually put in a hidden camera inside the room so that way we begin to find out what's going on with Doris. And during that night, Doris had found the hidden camera. Yeah, great. Now we're going to get those jump scares. Well, yep, there was a jump scare, right? And when she found the camera, she she goes around bringing in a knife, just already trying to threaten to actually kill them by trying to open the door. That didn't work. So they wanted to brew in the camera footage in order to, for them to contact their mother to find out what's going on with John and Doris. And yeah, that's pretty much um, what the movie's all about, you know. Which I'm not going to give away the secrets on towards the end of the movie, but I guess it's best not to, you know, mention it right away. But all I can say is it is sort of an interesting idea about having 
you know, your grandparents, you know, who are actually very nice and sweet. I mean, you definitely feel sorry for them, too, you know, having to deal with what this, what's going on. But, yeah, and they were actually nice, anyway. But what made it worse is their strange behavior. And all of this is going on, and it just makes it worse for for the two kids who had to wind up living with them for the entire week. It is kind of depressing to see, you know, elderly people actually acting like this. Because now you know you feel sorry for them. But I swear to God, the two kids in this movie are completely annoying. And once again, we're just getting more bad actors that just can't act. We're getting, once again, more of the same technology, just like all these stupid found footage movies are. You know, where they're just bringing in their laptops bringing in their cameras, they go around, you know, filming nothing but themselves, just, you know, going around making fools of themselves, doing their interviews, so on and so forth, it just gets tiresome. And yeah, having to see a kid named Tyler actually started using random celebrity names such as Shania Train, Sir McLaughlin, Katy Perry, Carrie Underwood, and yeah, he even mentioned One Direction, that stupid boy band from the UK. Yeah, yeah, because even Rebecca mentioned it as well. I wonder if I meet someone who loves boy bands or whatever. And yeah, he just goes around, you know, talking, you know, saying, I, I want to be texting, you know, while they're in the car, you know, with their mother and, and their sister, Rebecca. They're all already going on their way to the train station. Just so they can meet their grandparents. Oh man, I wanted to strangle that kid to death. I want this asshole to shut up. I mean, oh god, and don't get me started on his rapping too. Oh my fucking god. He's a terrible rapper. What the fuck? And Rebecca is even worse. I mean, she's just another plain boring character. Just goes around with her trusty camera just... You know, filming herself and her brother, you know, along with um, having to do interviews with her grandparents, her mother and all that. And uh, I'm sorry, she's just totally worthless. Uh, and while the mother is actually sweet, you know, very caring, just sad that, she, you know, she had to put up with her, her stupid parents and... And it, it's also sad to actually have her brought these two kids to their grandparents in the first place. Because they knew something was going wrong, even though, you know, she hasn't met him for 15 years. So, that's just saying a lot. But man, I just wish these two kids would just get killed off and just have the film over with. I just can't stand them. I don't know what Shyamalan was thinking when he did this. I know maybe he wanted to come up with it just for comedy and laughs, but I didn't find that funny. I mean, I, I don't understand. I mean, Shyamalan can do better than this. But let's face it, you know, he did it better when he did the movie The Sixth Sense with Haley Joe Osment. And yes, and he was a good actor, too. Yeah. He did okay with some of the kids in, in those other films, but, but then when he did films like the Last Airbender, this just goes to show you, he just can't do it anymore. And that's why he needs to stop. But with that aside, it has an interesting premise, a good idea, but sadly, it's just a forgettable waste of time. And I'm going to be honest with you, this movie is definitely not up there with his previous classics. I think this movie will just be forgotten, never to remember again, and <laughs> let's keep it that way. Because I think Wide Awake is a much better film than this. Yeah, and I know, it's not even a horror film. It's, it's a comedy. Well, I don't know. But, I'm going to keep it that way. So anyway, I give The Visit two stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.